stand before the Lord this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hallelujah. Is the Lord good? <laughs> David said the Lord is good. <laughs> his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. <laughs> Lord, we bless you because you are good. You are good, you are good, you are good, Lord. We lift our voice in this sanctuary. Go ahead and lift your voice all over the room. Lift up your sound of worship unto your King. Hallelujah. Father, we bless your name this morning. We thank you that you are here with us, Lord. Where two or three are gathered, you are in our midst, oh God. And Lord, it's you that we long for this morning. It's your face that we seek. It's your heart that we want to know, Lord. Oh, Lord, you said that we would find you if we seek you with all of our heart. <laughs> so, Lord, this morning we rend our heart and not our garment. And we come before you with singing. We come before you rejoicing. We come before you with thanksgiving. You are good. You are so true in all your ways. Who is like you, God? Who is like you? Who is like you? There is no one. There is none other. There is no one above you or beside you, Lord. We exalt you. We exalt you. We exalt you. We exalt you. Come on, lift your voice this morning. Pour upon him your love. Pour out your love on him. For who you are, for who you are, for all you've done, we magnify you, Lord. If we had 10,000 tongues, it would not be enough. If we had 10,000 the throne this morning, <laughs> to sit on the throne of our heart, of this service, of our praise, of the word. We invite you to take your place, King of Kings. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. And Lord, we welcome the glory of God, <laughs> the weighty presence, the kavod, we say, come, Lord. We are welcoming you this morning. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. And God of Jacob, huh, great I am, King of angels, Son of man, you're the voice of man. So much louder than the fun. We ask you, Lord, make your glory known. Oh, I left you. Yeah. Let the lion roar. Oh, I left you. Let the lion roar.
invite you to come and be the king over our lives, our hearts, our minds, this territory, this region, this city, this nation, God. There is a remnant crying out who has not bowed the knee. And Lord, we prepare a throne for you to rule on. We prepare a throne on our worship. We prepare a throne on our praises. Come and reign. Come and reign. Come and reign. Come and reign. Let the lion roar. Roar. Let it roar. You are welcome, Lord. You are welcome. Would you roar?
have all authority here. You have all authority here. We surrender to your will. We surrender to your will. to see you and know you more. You are the Lord here. Have your way here. You are the Lord here. <laughs> Come and have your way. Have your way. Have your way. We love you, Lord. Complete surrender this morning, Lord. Whatever you want to say, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to change, whatever you want to take, you are the Lord here. You are the Lord, you are the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
is when we see you, Lord. When we encounter your glory, everything changes. Lord, everything changes. Chains fall, fear bow here and now. Oh, Jesus, you change everything.
there is one who is worthy. There is one who is worthy. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Because being God, not ashamed to call himself equal with God, became a man. He became flesh because we needed a Savior. And he humbled himself to death. And of all the deaths that he could humble himself to, he chose the shame of crucifixion. And he went to the cross despising the shame because of his great love for you. His great desire for you and I. Which is why there is no one worthy to open the scroll except him. He is the one. He is the door. He is the hope of our salvation. There is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. And that is the name of Jesus. We celebrate the communion as believers because we understand that without the body and blood of Jesus, we would have no hope. Lost, forever separated from God because of sin. Before we take this communion, This is also an invitation for anyone that has not chosen Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Why partake of the symbol of his body and his blood before we have partaken of his person? You are invited to commit your life to the one who died for you today. And it's simple. The Bible says if we believe with our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess him with our mouths we shall be saved. And at Bride Ministries the body of Christ we believe that Jesus is born of a virgin, that he died for our sins and was raised again to life on the third day. So, Jesus, thank you for what you've done. And for anyone that wants to commit their lives, you can repeat after me and say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Savior of the world and you died for my sins. You were born of a virgin, and you also were raised again to life on the third day. I receive you, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. I receive forgiveness of sins. And I invite you to live your life in me and through me. You know, when Jesus was teaching his disciples about what he would do when he went to the cross, he, he took the bread and he explained to them, friends, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus received 39 lashes from a whip 
as he was being prepared for the cross. There were 39 major categories of disease in the human body. He died for our healing. His body was broken for us. And so Jesus, in remembrance of what you did for us, we take the bread. disciples this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you when you drink it do so in remembrance of me let's take the cup Jesus you're the star of the show you're the captain of the ship. And we thank you for the privilege of being counted members of your body. We receive what you have done for us. And we call you worthy. Holy. Righteous. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Y'all doing all right? Is that worship awesome? I'm telling you, every time we do one of these worship nights, it just digs that well a little deeper. It's getting, it's getting harder and harder to take away the service from the worship team. I, I'm like, we're, we're, we're inching closer. Y'all just might get left up here. Where's Dan? He left. He left. Dan's on vacation. Worship only. Two hours. Two hours. I'll see you next week. <laughs> so... We are so grateful for what the Lord is doing in the house. I'm telling you what, we're so grateful. Um, we are so grateful for the fact that we are growing despite all of the opposition. For those of you online, you're going to watch this in a little while from the time this is being recorded. Our live stream is completely down today because it is just that bad. There's no way to get an internet signal out of this place. But you know what? Here's the good news. We got a couple months at most, maybe one month. We, they gave us 60 to 90 days, and we are rounding the curb on 30. So in another 30 to 60 days, we'll have a hard line of Internet coming in here. We'll, we will not have interruptions in Internet connection anymore. This whole season is coming to an end. Um, we're going to have a family meeting shortly after church to talk a little bit more about the transition because we're going to have to go to two services. As you can see, we're, we're really moving into a crisis and, and – <laughs> It's a good problem to have. We want you guys here, you know, and for all of you that are members locally and you choose to stay home to make room for those that cannot fit, I, you know, we, we, we are just understanding it's a situation. We're working through it. Um, and so, and, and we're sowing into it. You know, we, we, we are expecting God to do extraordinary things here in Katy, Texas. Absolutely extraordinary things. And we're at the center of it. We're calling it in. We have chosen to take our role as a governing body to the region, and we're taking that seriously. We are interceding for the region. We are worshiping for the region. We are going after it, and we're going to be training and equipping, not just for the region, for the whole world. And I'll tell you, what we are after, we are going after the deprogramming of the world. Praise the Lord. We believe God's bigger than the problem. And so we are going to collect the offering at this time. For those of you that have come to the house and you brought cash or checks, um, we have Wes who has a basket, and he will come to you, and you can give us the cash or checks that you have brought for the rest of us that give online. BrideMovement.com and the Bride Ministries app have conveniently located donate buttons. Thank you for all of you that give online. You know, this is not one of those churches where we set up the basket in the front and watch everyone come up one by one. And, you know, because <laughs> we know y'all are giving online. And we're grateful for that. We are grateful. We are grateful. We are grateful. And at Bride Ministries, we expect. So right now, I'm going to take an opportunity to bless the offering and to call in what we expect 
for those of us that are sowing. Father God, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus because we know you are faithful who promises. We know you are the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We know that you are the Lord of the harvest. And it is written, he who sows abundantly will reap abundantly. So we choose to sow. And as we sow, we expect to reap. We are reaping, Lord God, bills paid. We are reaping, Lord God, medical bills cleared. We are reaping, Lord God, mortgages completed. Lord God, paid in full in the name of Jesus. We are reaping car notes paid in full in the name of Jesus. We are reaping multiple streams of income in the name of Jesus. We are reaping wisdom. We are reaping opportunity, divine appointments and connections in Jesus' name. You are the God that opens the doors that no man can shut and we let forth our expectation because we know that you are moving and you have chosen us as your vehicle in the earth to use and to expand. And so we thank you for expanded tents. We thank you, Lord God. You lengthen our cords and you strengthen our stakes. So we bless this offering and we bless the move of your hand in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Welcome back to Bride Ministries Church. If it is your first time joining us, welcome. We are so happy to have you. Friends online, thank you for being with us. Uh, the Bright Ministries 2024 advance is quickly approaching. This year, it is being held November 7th through 10th at the Weston Oaks at the Galleria. And I want to emphasize for everyone who is joining us that it is the Weston Oaks at the Galleria. There's the Weston Galleria, and then there's the Weston Oaks at the Galleria, which Ed found out the hard way. Uh, sorry, Ed. <laughs> You're over there close to me, so I, I you know. Um, but just remember, guys, uh, Weston Oaks, remember Oaks, because we are trees of righteousness. So that's the one we're going to be at. No, one, no one's going to forget now. So I want to tell you all, um, one of the really special events that's happening this year at the events, um, many of us found Bride Ministries because of the Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall podcast, myself included. Over 10 years ago, I found that podcast seemingly by accident, and literally my life was never the same. Uh, at the advance this year, for the first time ever, Daniel will be doing a live interview with a similar format to the podcast with a panel of overcomers. So this is a do not miss event. We are so excited about that. So you can go to booking.brightmovement.com for all the information and to reserve your spot today. There are a few spots left, so um, we have just over two months. So booking.brightmovement.com. The last day to apply for the School of Inner Healing and Deliverance is November 30th. No, um, the School of Inner Healing and Deliverance is a comprehensive three-year program designed to build the army of God that will deprogram the world through the power of Jesus Christ. You can go to the ministry tab on our website for the link to the School of Inner Healing and Deliverance. You can find out the details of the commitment, the breakdown of each year, as well as sign up for an open house Zoom call. Um, so that's booking.brightmovement.com. I'm sorry, under the ministry tab. I think I said that wrong. Booking.brightmovement.com. <laughs> under the ministry, <laughs> ministry tab. Good thing we're not live right now. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, <laughs> Bride Ministries is looking for translators. So we need to expand our global reach. The goal is to make our prayers accessible to as many people as possible. Um, so that they can find the same freedom that we are finding utilizing our prayer resources. And we are in particular need of translators in German, Italian, and Afrikaans. So if you are interested in volunteering for our translation project, um, you can fill out the volunteer form on our website. Um, we love your testimonies. We know that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And we would love to have you submit a testimony to us. During worship today, I was thinking back on, you know, just some of the more difficult seasons in my own walk with the Lord and how the testimonies of others who were walking through the same situations that I was were invaluable to me. A lot of times I think I might not have made it through. I might have given up um, on my walk had I not had other people paving the way. And I know that, you know, in our community, I'm not the only one that feels that way. We have survivors who, you know, a lot of times you think you're 
your situation, you may be the only one in the world. Even the church doesn't believe sometimes that what you're going through is true. And so the testimonies are so important for the strengthening of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you would like to submit a testimony, we encourage you to do so on our website. And you can also record a video and you can submit that to testimonies at bridemovement.com and we will play your video here in church. Um, so again, bridemovement.com to submit your testimonies. Local church movie night is this Friday. Yes. We will be meeting August 6th at 7.30 p.m. here in the dwelling place. This month, what did I say? I'm sorry, September. September 6th. Y'all, I'm going to get fired this morning from announcements. I am canceled. September 6th at 7.30 Central Time here in the Dwelling Place. We're going to be watching Let My People Go by Dr. David Clements, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards. It's going to be amazing. For those of you who were here, the last one you know, we had a great time, a great discussion. It was very uplifting, as well as just good fellowship and good popcorn. So it was really, really good. Um, and Daniel has requested coconut oil for the popcorn this time. So uh, my husband, Mark, is going to make that happen for you guys. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, so, yes, this Friday movie night, we're going to go ahead and release the children. And I'm going to give the microphone to Ed so I can stop talking now. Bless you all. Let's give a round of applause, everyone. That's a, that's a lot of announcements. And she makes it look so easy. Good job, Cody. You rock. Praise God. Well, family, good morning and bless you. Uh, for those of you who are joining us in the house for the first time, we welcome you and we say thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for bringing your supply. We really do appreciate it. I know they're not with us currently, but you're watching this and God is doing something amazing through it and with it and with you. So just appreciate and accept the love that we're extending to you now because it's a lot of it. Praise God. So. So I thought, you guys, this week, I was like, okay, Dad, I really do need to give Dan back his minute, like, for real, because the series has been really good. <laughs> so I'm spending time with Father. You know, sometimes you just, you just kind of like, maybe if I kind of get over here, he won't see me. <laughs> so I'm doing that all up until this morning, which is comical, because I thought, okay, Father, you're not going to give me anything. So I was like, I'm good, I'm good. Nope, that wasn't the case. He said, no, Edward, there is something I want my kids to know. I said, okay, Dad, well, I'll speak on. So the times in which we're entered and where we are going, there is um, sometimes there's going to be an agenda that we have. And Father confirmed it this morning because the worship was going to go a different way. But Holy Spirit showed up and said, no, it's going this way. That's what dad wants us to know as we move forward. As we prepare for the future, we have an agenda, but Father has an agenda. Dan said something last week, and, and actually when he said it, my spirit just leaped. And um, often we're coming to God, it's like, God, I have something I would like for you to do. And, and Father's saying, but I have something I want you to do. So understand that in the season in which we're in, um, be okay with timing, Father's timing, because his purpose is greater than ours. So if he tells you to go left, to go right, and to be inconvenienced, be okay with it. Amen, because there is a plan. Glory to God. Okay, Dan. All right. Look, um, y'all want the whiteboard? Yeah. Now, I want to ask a question. Okay, so this, this has been one of the most brutal series of all time. I'm telling you, this whole time, like, the enemy has just come against. As soon as I started, it, I, it was like the internet just went out, like, every week. And this has been the most challenging. It's like, I don't know what it is about this series. Maybe it's because we're saying stuff like the New World Order is doomed to failure and other very encouraging, you know, concepts. The enemy is just upset. You know what? It's a good day to give the devil a bad day. I'm telling you, I'm so encouraged. I was like, you know, the more opposition, the more I know we're hovering over the target, praise the Lord. And so, so we, we just take it, you know, it's just like, go ahead, give us your best shot <laughs> because we're coming for you. You know, uh, we have been in a series on Ezekiel's temple, which is deep. 
And in order to put any context around us, we've had to go far and wide in an exploration of biblical eschatology that has left us week after week in the middle of a conversation that just doesn't seem to end. I've actually preached one sermon this whole time for a month and a half. Now we're going, you know, part seven. I've been preaching one sermon. I just stop. And then we continue. It's one conversation. I have not concluded anything yet. I may conclude this week. Now, how many of you would be sad if I did get to the end of these notes? Oh, no. You guys are gluttons for pain. Okay, so, so we're going to do an abbreviated review. There is a temple that is described in the book of Ezekiel. And this temple was never built, but it has extraordinary implications. We learn about one of them in Ezekiel 47, which is where we've been uh, really driving on this series. It says that from this temple, there are going to flow forth a, a river of living water that brings healing to everything it touches, right? And um, that's from Ezekiel 47. And, and so this unique temple has a lot of very interesting aspects. Number one, um, because it was never built and because it so are certain functions that include animal sacrifices. It's difficult to make any kind of case for its existence in this age of salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. So the likely implication on this is that it's for a future manifestation. But what is that future manifestation? What does that even mean? Um, this temple lacks a lot of the elements of former temples, and we've talked about it. No court of women, no laver, no table of showbread, no lampstand or menorah, no golden altar of incense, no veil, no Ark of the Covenant. None of these things seem to be part of this temple. But this temple does receive the return of the kabod glory of the Lord. And it is connected to the restoration of the land to the 12 tribes of Israel, which is another conversation that is just so confounding. So in order to place context around this, we've talked about several aspects, right? And so I, I, I gave you guys this little kind of like timeline of events where, you know, here we have you know, uh, 32 A.D., this is Jesus, right? And now we know that he's going to come back. So at a certain point, he does. And we called that the seventh trumpet, okay? And we said that is the resurrection, okay? And that's also the, the changing of the church where those that are alive and remain uh, receive new bodies, automatic, and from that point on, there is pretty much a, a war campaign um, that finds its conclusion at Armageddon. And that is not the beginning of the war. It's actually the end of the war. We talked about Jesus is taking his whole army and we're going through portals and this and that. So when we say heaven opened and Jesus came out at Armageddon in Revelation 19, this is actually the end of this campaign after which there is a wedding supper of the lamb. And then we move into the judgment seat of Christ. Right, And that has two phases. And we talked about the saints getting their rewards and the um, sheep and goat nations. And um, after that, we move on into the millennial reign. Which we have a lot of questions about. And... The question, the big question, right, is this the new heaven and new earth or not? And I want to put a big, fat series of question marks because, you know, this is another theological debate. And somewhere in here, right, we've said this is probably where Ezekiel's temple actually finds a functional season. This is how far we've come. All right. So now we're going to jump right back into the notes. Y'all okay with this? Yes. If you're not, the whole record of the conversation is online. So it's, you know, 
is there for? Now, back to our narrative. We've been journeying to a revelation on where the mortal population of the new heavens and new earth comes from. So, so I'm actually going to jump right into this conversation, and we're going to back engineer some thoughts, right? Because I'm going to point out some things, and it's going to be like, oh, that's a hard saying, Dan. Let's start off in Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. It says in verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. Now, now here's the thing, right? So before I go any further, I'm going to say this. For many people, and myself included, whenever I read any passage that had to do with the new heavens and new earth, Isaiah 65, Revelation 21, Revelation 22, I turned something off in my brain. And what I turned off in my brain was thinking. I actually just said, oh, this is the, the realm of perfections. Whatever I'm reading next is all about how perfect everything is. So I, I, I'm going to be honest. I didn't actually read the words. And a lot of people, I think, fall into a similar category. It's like, well, what do you think is going to be the case when we have the new heaven and the new earth? Oh, everything's perfect. Where would you get that from? The Bible? Okay. Well, but let's read what it actually says. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, verse 9. So this is the new heavens and new earth. I will rejoice in Jerusalem. Now, interestingly enough, God is still using Jerusalem in the new heavens and new earth. Jerusalem is around, right? So the city. And joy in my people. And, you know, the interesting thing is that in the heavenly Jerusalem, it is going to be the case that there will not be weeping. There will not be crying. There will not be pain. And that's what it says here. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. But what it doesn't say is that there is a city and there is the earth. Now, remember, when we got to the judgment seat of Christ, what I told you is that the saints get their reward and they are the city. We are the bride of Christ. Amen. The city is the people. But the nations... Enter in because of their works. That's the judgment of sheep and goat nation. What I said was the judgment sheet of Christ is works from beginning to end. You either, either get a reward or lose a reward. And the, de the, the destiny of the nations hinges on how they interacted with the brothers of Christ. Which is his people. So now you have this group. They are not the city. They are not the city. But they're there. Now take a look at verse 20. In Isaiah 65, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die. The child shall die. The child shall die. Now, if everything's perfect, and by the way, what's the last enemy that's going to be destroyed? Death. Death. But the child shall die. Ooh. That's an inconvenient statement in the context of the new heavens and new earth. I'm just reading what it says, right? Now, these are things that theologians have avoided, like me. I never preach Isaiah 65. Run from it. Run from it. Man, I don't want to get into this debacle because then I know someone's going to ask. I am accountable because I have the people's time now, so I know I'm stepping into it every week. Every week is a headache for Dan Duvall. And so... Whatever I bring up, there will be accountability. I have to be prepared. So the child shall die. Oh, my gosh. In the new heavens and new earth, there's death. So what, what is this about death being defeated? We'll come back to that. Now, it says also, but the sinner being 100 years old. The, so you have sinners in the new heaven and the new earth. It's right there. They will be accursed at 100 years old. Hmm. And then it goes on to talk about other aspects of this world. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the day of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. 
And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. Which means that there are actually going to be children being brought forth in this world of the new heavens and new earth. Hence why there will be children that die. But this is actually what it says. You, you understand? Yeah. This is actually what it says. Now, now, let's keep going on. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they're still speaking, I will hear. And here it is. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. Now, this is a dynamic change because it seems like the way that the animals interact with each other comes under a reorganization. Fundamentally, there, there's a different psychology in the animals themselves in the planet. In fact, the very next verse says, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. A lion becomes a vegan. Who would have thought? <laughs> I saw the inverse of this just recently because my wife, who was a vegan when I met her, has become a carnivore. <laughs> Rawr. <laughs> this, no vegetables at all. Just... Steaks and beef. Just, let's see, she's she's working it out. Bacon. Let me say something. That pig was not crossing the altar of my home seven years ago. It's, it's parked it right there at the doormat. So, th but things can change. New heavens, and new earth. Now, now you have lions that are vegans. I mean, this is crazy stuff. And, and then it says, dust shall be the serpent's food. Okay. And they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Which means that Zion is incorruptible and it is established here as well. So you not only have to Jerusalem, you have the holy mountain of Zion. And then it says, says the Lord. So if anyone was confused about the nature of the new heavens and the new earth, just ask God. Isaiah 65. He'll tell you. It's not necessarily as prim and proper and perfect as we thought or wanted to think. I, I wanted to think it was different. I have struggled with this passage my whole Christian life. It's inconvenient. Now, now I, Isaiah 65, it describes all these things. But, but how is it possible if we believe there is no death in the new heavens and new earth, that there are children dying. How is it possible that if death is the last enemy to be destroyed, and then we enter new heavens and new earth, there is still more death? One of the inflammatory statements I made as we were getting into this whole series on Ezekiel's temple is I said, look, we haven't gotten this far yet, but what I'm going to tell you is, there are two ways people lean, okay? There are two ways people lean, all right? You have the, the, the start of the millennium, and then you have a thousand years, according, and this is Revelation 20, okay? And then you have the great white throne. Now, there are two basic modes of thought. A, this happens, and then we have a new heavens and earth. Okay? That's A. B is that the new heaven actually starts here. That's B. And I've said that I lean towards B, which is also problematic. Now, I'll tell you why. So I'm going to walk you into the debacle. You better be glad Ed didn't take longer because we might have run into the... <laughs> we might have run into the cliff right here. Th this is the thing. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Let's start. And I saw the dead both small and great, standing before God. So this is right here, the great right throne. All right? And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, 
take note of that word, see, gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. You see that? Where are they cast? Lake of fire. Who's cast in there? Death and Hades. This is the second death. Check it out. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But look at this very, very next verse, which is actually Revelation 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and new earth. Ah, there's this guy. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Wait a minute. No more sea. We'll go back to... Go back to... Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. So if the sea is giving up the dead who are in it, here and here there is no more sea. How could this possibly start here? Because you'd need no more sea here, and clearly there is a sea here. It's so confusing. You know what it feels like? It feels like a double bind. Like if you get this far, you will just loop and loop and loop and loop. It's like, no more C, but there is death. But there's no more C, but there is death. Ah! I'm in a double bind. I cannot get the right answer. No matter how I work it out, right? Because if I say... Like, okay, d death is over. Then why, why are people dying in the new heavens and new earth, according to Isaiah 65, right? It's in there. It's happening. Death is in the new heavens and new earth, at least part of it. <laughs> so now that we've set the context for today's discussion, <laughs> we're really going to get into it. How many of y'all are glad both of my babies were fussing and crying and sick while I was trying to make these notes? <laughs> <clears throat> this is where we come to a concept I call intellectual humility, right? Don, I'm, I'm, I'm going to walk out into the deep end. I'm going to actually walk the plank here. Come on. Understand, I think I have some good answers. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we may turn around in three or four years and realize I didn't have all the answers. I'm okay with that. Amen. You know, if y'all are okay with that, you yeah. go back, check my own work, be good Bereans, and sometimes <laughs> figure out that I was actually wrong, and then it's like, okay, well, we can all grow together. Like, I, I've, been, I've been trying to work this out for years. I just didn't tell anybody. It's just a scary problem to acknowledge. Now, why do I believe... That, that, that the new heavens and new earth actually starts at the inception of the millennial reign, okay? Why do I believe that that is the way it is? Why do, and, and what this does when you read the word of God, basically you end up with an idea that John sees the, the millennial reign play out in Revelation 20, and then he takes a step back from the great white throne to talk about viewing the bride come in at the beginning of the millennial reign for Revelation 21 and 22. That would be the idea. The other view is John just walks through Revelation 20, 21, and 23 in a straight line. Okay? Why do I believe that Revelation 21 and 22 is actually him taking a step back and saying this is how it works when the bride comes in at the beginning of the millennial reign, which is also the emerging of a new heaven and new earth all at the same time. Number one, Revelation 21 describes the arrival of the bride. Okay? So that's one, the bride. Now, all throughout the New Testament, books of the, uh, 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 
of the whole New Testament. Really, as you begin to work on your eschatology around the second coming of Christ, you see wedding themes from beginning to end. Wedding themes from beginning to end. In, in, in Revelation 19, we say the wife of the lamb has made herself ready. Right? So that all these wedding themes, and then we see the bride, but we say, no, 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 no. Jesus is coming back to marry a bride a thousand years after his arrival. To me, that's more confusing than to say I have a wedding processional and a wedding feast and I'm married. Why would you have a wedding feast and then get married a thousand years later? Just, you know. So that's one reason why. You know, here, here it is. Revelation 21 verses 9 through 10. Revelation 21, 9 through 10. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride. The who? The bride. The lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. That's Revelation 21. That's after the new heavens and new earth. Right? So what am I saying? I'm saying it seems to make sense that the bride would be introduced at his return. Now, number two, it seems that this city almost serves as a sun or a light source for the earth which has a population that is not synonymous with the saints because the nations of the earth and the kings of the earth are walking in its light, that is, in the light of the city. Um, also, nothing that defiles can enter the city, meaning that there seems to be some kind of insinuation that there are things that can defile on the earth. So... In other words, you have this massive, I, I mean, and this is one way I've, I've, I've visualized it, okay? So you have this, like, you know, massive cube. This is the bride. It is the heavenly Jerusalem, okay? And then you have the earth because these sides of the city are 1,500 miles Per side, that, that's 12,000 furlongs. That's how big this is, okay? This is Mount Everest times 250. That's how tall this is, okay? 250 Mount Everest going up. This is not an ascended location on the earth. It's too big. It's like a moon or a sun, or a light source. Now let's look at what it actually says in Revelation 21. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Remember when we were talking about Ezekiel, and we said, well, could Ezekiel's temple be the heavenly Jerusalem? And I said, no. This one has, this, there's no temple in here. The temple somewhere down here. So there's no temple in it. I saw no temple in it. The, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of the Lord illuminated it. Now look at this. The Lamb is its light. Verse 24. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. The nations are actually walking in the light that comes off of this thing. And bring their honor into it. Its gate shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations. So now we have the nations interacting on the earth. And they have an interaction with the city. Here's what it says. They bring glory and honor of the nations into it. But, verse 27, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, which seems to insinuate the idea that down here there is defilement of some sort. Lies. Right? New heavens and new earth. This is what we're talking about. Okay? All of this happens in that context. But this cannot Go here, only the glory and honor of the nations. That does go there. It's what it says. Now, this is so interesting. I'm talking through 
problematic scriptures, I think, if anyone has been honest with themselves, they didn't want to do this Bible study. <laughs> nah. I have been delaying this conversation the whole time. You don't even know. I've been slow walking it. I'm like, I can stop it right here. I don't have to go any further. All right, I got one more week to figure this out. This is so problematic, so confusing. Revelation 21 in verse 2 through 4. Um, okay, hold on before I get there. Number three. Okay, so number two. Um, number two is the city and the nations and an interaction. All right. Number three, number three is um, really the, def the, the, the defilement of earth. Okay? The defilement of earth. Why do I think that the new heavens and new earth opens up at the beginning of millennium? Because it's not a perfect state at all. Look at this. Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. Remember, Zechariah 14 talks about some of the Lord's commandments in the future context, such as they need to go up to the temple year after year and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. That's a commandment. Right? Verse 15, but outside of this city, outside are, it doesn't say were, it says are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters. All in the new heaven and new earth. Oh, you didn't read it? I'm reading the book. I'm reading the book. This is what it says. And whoever practices a lie. So you have the city, and then you have everything outside the city, which seems to be occurring in the earth. Now, this doesn't explain the problem of the sea, which is what we may or may not get to this week. But, but these are some of the reasons why I'm saying I think the new heavens and the new earth is part of why there is a government proceeding forth from Jesus through his people into that millennial reign. There's a lot of things that need to be overseen, reigned in, governed, right, checked on, or just checked, period, People have suggested that there is no death in the new heavens and new earth. But even here, the only place that death is not occurring is specifically in the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay? Specifically here. No death. But not here. And so... This is what it says. Revelation 21, verses 2 through 4. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and he shall be, they, they, they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away Every tear from their eyes, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. All of that is in the context of the city. Because we know exactly what's going on outside of the city. That's what it says. Point number five. It seems... That there is a forward-speaking statement made. Forward-speaking statement of judgment. And that comes from Revelation 21, verses 7 through 8. Let's take a look. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, 
and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall, which means will, have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This seems to be a forward-speaking judgment after the new heavens and new earth is already announced in verse 1. So now you guys can begin to see why, in deep study, I find the weight of the evidence to actually fall on the side of a new heaven and new earth opening up with the revealing of the bride at the return of Christ. And that our procession into a millennial reign is actually also paired with a new heaven and new earth emerging, which is imperfect. It's new, but it's imperfect in the earth, and there is still more to come. In fact, once the devil is released from the pit after a thousand years, this is Revelation 20, he goes forth and deceives the nations of the earth from the four corners, Gog and Magog. Who is he deceiving? I'm going to tell you who he's deceiving. The defiled, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the murderers. The, 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 because there's a lot of people that fall into this category outside of the city at the end. In fact, and we'll get there, um, this is what it says in Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 7. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. You know, I always read Revelation 20 for a long time. I was like, where did these people come from? How do you get through the return of Christ? Jesus is physically pure, ruling and reigning. People have been glorified, transformed, resurrection of the dead. We're a thousand years into this thing and as many as the sand of the sea are deceived again by this guy? Where did these people even come from? And then I was like, did the saints get deceived after choosing Jesus the first time? Like, who are these people? Well, we figured that out last week. These people are the sheep nations that enter in, not because they believed in Jesus at all, but because they didn't die and their works and interaction with the brothers of Christ actually allow for an imputed righteousness that grants them access to the kingdom which they are inheriting in this earth that is now a new heavens and new earth context, in my opinion, to then begin to live into a millennial reign where they will have children and there will be substantial peace and there will be substantial justice and things will actually be very good at first but there will be a deterioration over a thousand year period that produces a company of people as much as the sand of the sea to be deceived by satan at the end now when we understand all of these pieces we can understand something else. And, and I'm going to point out a passage to you. This one is also so problematic. Now, if you've do, ever done a deep study in the book of Daniel, you know this book of Daniel is tough. I mean, it's tough. And there are it's stuff he's prophesying about. He's like, <laughs> and then you're doing your numbers, 1260, 1290, 1335. And Michael shows up. And this is the little horn. But who is this king? And what's this? Ser I don't know this in the history books. Like, oh, my gosh. This is like. Everything is all over the place, you know. You have, you and and so, the, the book of Daniel, you got to spend a lot of time with this thing. You got to spend a lot of time with this thing. But there's a certain point at which the Bible is talking about the little horn, which is an antichrist figure. Yeah, the little horn is as an antichrist figure, and you see his destruction. Okay, and I'm going to show you that in a second. But then. Daniel makes a statement that is disturbing. Okay, now, now, you have to understand, in the book of Daniel, you actually see various kingdoms described as animals. Okay, so, so there's a, 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 like a, like a bear, right? There's a, um, I think a lion. There's, um, this is all in Daniel chapter 8. And, and so, you see these different beasts, and then you see the little horn, and the beasts are kingdoms. And they don't seem to be entirely pro-God kingdoms. Um, 
Look at this. Verse 11 of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Sorry, not chapter 8. But Daniel chapter 7. So it says, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words, which the little horn, the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And then you have this verse that's so troubling. It says, as for the rest of the beasts. So this is after Antichrist is essentially chucked in the lake of fire when we map it to the book of Revelation. It says, the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So all the beasts you read about in Daniel chapter 7 that are these evil kingdoms have their lives preserved past the destruction of Antichrist into what? And why? I'm telling you. I mean, there are so many problematic scriptures in the word of God. And you, you, you just want so bad to believe. It. It's like new heavens and new earth, our glory, everything's perfect. Finally, I will not have to be behind on my bills. No more IRS. And then we read all of this stuff in context. We just read the plain scriptures and just say this is what it actually says. And it, it's turning all these things upside down. I mean, it turns them all upside down. And then we have this, Daniel 7. It's like the beasts get prolonged for a season and a time. Why would God do that? Just burn everything and make it perfect. But now we understand that there are powers and influences of evil that are moving even while Satan is locked in the pit. So if you wanted to know how you end up with a defilement and a murderer and a sorcerer when Satan is locked up, I promise you there are other forces permitted to move. And it says it in Daniel chapter 7. So we're answering all the questions. They're not fun answers. And then when we get to the end of Revelation 20, we understand exactly what the target of warfare is. So Satan's released from his prison. Verse 8, he goes out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose numbers is the sand of the sea. They went up. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, and the beloved city. So the Satan's final war in Revelation 20 is actually on this guy, the city. And fire came down from heaven, out of heaven, and devoured them. So this was, this is actually very, very brief. It's like, oh, that's what we've been waiting for the whole time. And then, pa, <laughs> done. All right. This, this was what we were waiting for the whole time. Pa pow. Why didn't you just do that in the beginning? Come on, man. Come on. Come on. It's, it's just so brief. It's like we went through all of this. And we opened a new heaven and new earth. And then it's like, what? but you could have just done that. I... Don't know. <laughs> That's what it says. All right. So now, now I'm just walking you through this, and I know there will be a lot of Bible studies to follow this conversation because you, we got a fact check. Okay. I hope you do, and you will be just like, oh my gosh! But then when I did it like this, and I looked at this, and this opened up, and that opened up. And the idea is that there is a new Jerusalem. That is a bride. And there's also the Ezekiel temple. Both. In the new heavens, new earth, millennial reign context. That's the idea. That's, this, is, this is the theory that I am presenting to you to answer the questions. I think they both exist simultaneously. And there is a quantum entanglement between the two. So the river of living water that starts here flows here. The glory of the Lord that lives here returns here. And so 
my best, my best guess is that this city actually orbits the earth. You know, one of the scriptures in the Bible says the sun shall be confounded and the moon ashamed when the Lord of hosts reigns before his saints gloriously. Why would the sun be ashamed if not for the fact that it's kind of being replaced <laughs> as a light source to the earth? Just one more thing that seems to make more sense now if we look at it like this. Because of the size and height of this city, 12,000 furlongs, it creates so many problems to try to figure out how you could put it on the surface of the earth. It, it's just very problematic to think about that. So what then we have is that those that are alive on the earth that are not born under the age of grace through faith must have a system of worship with which they interact with the Most High God. And it is in this context that a temple of Ezekiel where there's a different system of engaging with God may make sense because we're not looking to a God who we must believe in by faith anymore that that season is over he's here so now how do these sheep nations interact with God and their future generations it seems like we can at this point slot Ezekiel's temple in that context and let it be a literal interpretation word for word this temple will work exactly as described now as that temple is functioning during the millennial reign the people that descend from those that were considered sheep nations will continue to repopulate the earth and as they are repopulating the earth, these people have children who have children who have children who make their own choices and decisions in the context of some spiritual influences that are not necessarily positive, even though Satan himself is locked up. These are the beasts that had their lives prolonged for a time and a season, according to Daniel 7. Producing sorcerers and murderers. Dogs, idolaters, so on and so forth. All of these things that are described in the context of passages dealing with new heaven and new earth. But what about the sea? So I did all of this to tell you that I might be wrong on everything. Because at the end of the day, At the end of the day, we still have this problem. Wow. Checking my time. Checking my time. Checking my time. All right. I, I told Christian, I said, I think I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to finish today because if I don't, I will get shot. <laughs> <laughs> this is Texas. This is Texas, okay? Like, half of the people in this room are, like, conceal carry, all right? I got it. I do right to protect you. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to protect you from a bad choice, okay? All right? <laughs> Make a good choice. Make a good choice, Daniel. <laughs> All right. So the greatest challenge to all of this seems to be this, 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 this sea thing. Because at the end of Revelation 20, the sea gives us the dead which are in it. And then the next thing you see, there is no more sea. So the problem is... How do you have a sea go away and then a sea there for a thousand years? So it seems to be, and this is how I interpreted it for, I mean, I'm so very, you know. The first person to really introduce me to an alternative viewpoint on this was a guy by the name of Doug Hamp. And I did, a, you know, some, some uh, at least one or two podcasts with him way back. I'm talking like 2013, 2014. Um, and 
And he kind of carved out a, a, a deep study on the concept of millennial reign, and he was like, no, I think it's actually at the beginning. And I was like, what a stupid idea <laughs> because it's so simple that God made this a bonehead. Look, you just look. The sea is there, and then it's gone. So you, what, 20, 21 and 22, it's, it's counting. And he's like, no, 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 Daniel, look, I wrote this whole book. And, and it was like, so I'm going through his theology, and I'm like, that's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. But at the end of the day, I was like, but what about the sea? He's like, I think it's a small issue. <laughs> no, no, and, and he had better answers for that. He had a few things, but it was like, kind of like, ah, I, yeah, I like what you're saying, though. I, I do agree that you have so many good points on this. So, so, you know, I really respected his research on this, but even – through more recently, I was still stuck. I was like, I need, personally, for me, a really good explanation for the sea. If I can fully, like, sign off on this thing until, you know, five years later, I realize we were all wrong about everything and we have to start over. So <laughs> I'm going to draw you a picture, okay? All right, so, so, so this is the Mediterranean Sea. All right, and over here, this is the River Jordan, all right, this is the Dead Sea, this is Moab down here, I'm setting up so I don't have to do this while I'm in the middle of describing things, and, and you know, this is, this is Jerusalem, somewhere up here. All right, and, and this is not accurate because this kind of goes way more like this. Uh, so, <laughs> more like <laughs> right. I, I, that's what I thought. I was throwing you off. This right here, this that thing just ruined everything. Now we're all right. All right. Yeah. All right. Now, now here's the thing. Revelation 21 and verse 1. Let's take one more look at this just to make sure we didn't miss anything. Now I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Still there. All right. I've done this so many times. I just keep going, is that really what it says? No, it really says that. Oh, man. Come on. I actually got to God one day, and I was like, did you make a mistake? Like, I, I mean, I know you're, like, perfect, but maybe there's just one. <laughs> like, there's one really key mistake here. You just messed up. Like, can we just put the eraser? <laughs> I'm so close. <laughs> so, I will point out something, though. All right. One of the things that we have to acknowledge is that the Bible does not say there were no more waters. It says there was no more sea. Now, this, this is also very important. Why? Because when we read Ezekiel 47, we learn that there is a river of living water that flows forth from the temple through the east gate. And everything it touches, it heals, and then it goes into the sea. So if... There is no more sea at the beginning of the millennium. What sea is the river of living water going to flow into from Ezekiel's temple? So in order to combat the confusion, there are some ideas to be explored. It's like, well, how can we work around this very clearly frustrating statement? Number one, could the sea being referenced in Revelation 21 specifically refer to the Mediterranean Sea, or the Red Sea. Why? Because in certain passages of the Bible, when it says the sea, it is actually contextually either referring to the Red Sea or the Mediterranean Sea explicitly. Could it be the waters of humanity that is no more? Could it be the sea from which the first beast arises in Revelation 13? Because how do you have a beast arise from the sea? Is that metaphorical? Is that spiritual? Maybe that's the sea that goes away. Could it be the mysterious 
See that the waters cover. Here's an enigmatic scripture for you. Habakkuk 2 and 14, which is actually quoting Isaiah. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Can someone explain to me how waters cover sea? That's what I thought. So, um, could it be the sea of glass before the throne of God that goes away? Maybe there's, maybe it's no longer there as the bride is being presented, you know? These are all thoughts. Revelation 4, 6 describes it. But before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. So, I, I started with, as I was going through this, several thoughts. Like, well, maybe it could be this or maybe it could be that. Somehow I'm going to figure out a way to explain this away. <laughs> but really, I don't want to explain it away. I want to explain it. So the interesting thing, if we look at it through the lens of the sea of glass, is that this is not actually a physical body of water in the earth anyway. It's a polymorphic living stone. Is actually described as a sapphire stone when Moses encounters God on Mount Sinai. And later in the book of Revelation, John sees the, 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 the martyrs singing on this sea. In, in, in Revelation 15 too, it says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on a sea of glass, having the harps of God. So could it be that God just takes away this sea and it's not actually changing a geography of the earth? Like, I don't know. It doesn't say that he does. Moving on. I'm just asking questions. These are the questions I ask myself. One of the things that we need to map is that there is a word for sea in Greek. It is thalassa. 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 This is not the word used for waters. You have a word for waters and you have thalassa. That's sea. And so... <coughs> Could, could it be something else? You know, there's this other passage in Revelation 5 and verse 13. Interesting passage. It says, every creature, and, and in there um, I put katisma. That's the Greek. It means a created thing. Every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea. The lasso. And all that are in them. This describes realms within realms of existence. You know the sea has the dead in it? This is crazy. Right? So in heaven, on earth, in the sea, and everything in those created things in these superstructures. I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever because every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. All right, so that's. That's interesting. So, so the sea is also referenced here. There are created things with sentient beings in them that will bless the throne of Lamb. And the sea is a vast realm of activity alongside heaven and earth. So what's the right answer? So you do have this conversation around Thalassa where Thalassa can actually be used in context to reference sea in general. Like just sea, any body of water. And also specifically, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, depending on context. Well, as we continue to look at some of these uh, passages dealing with the sea, it only gets more confusing. But I'm going to tell you something. As I, as I started to think about this really critically, I said, but where was John when he wrote the book of Revelation? He was on the Isle of Patmos. Let's read Revelation 1.9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, if we just kind of pretend that Greece is here, okay, Patmos is one of the Greek isles, okay? It's actually in an area of the Mediterranean Sea called the Aegean Sea specifically. The Apostle John was exiled to Patmos under the persecution of the Roman Emperor Domitian because he was witnessing. In fact, tradition says they first tried to put him in a pot of oil and boil him to death. And it just expanded his anointing. Go figure. So they pulled him out all oily and 
Well, we're just going to put you on an island where there's no one to preach to. So they shipped him over to Patmos and just said, survival island. You know, this was, he was the first survivor. Public, uh, you know. Um, series on television. Okay, so. This is the context of the book of Revelation. It all happens here. So when we actually become contextually minded as we are viewing certain things John is writing in the book of Revelation, we can begin to understand that some of his visions are interacting with the geography he's in. I'm going to give you an example. Revelation 10 and verse 7. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head, his face shone like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the talasa, and his left foot on the land. So, so what land? See, this right here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bring this out so I can draw you a good picture. So, so, there's John. So, John is on this island, and he sees this angel with his foot on the shore and his foot on the sea. But what sea? Actually, it's the Aegean Sea as part of the Mediterranean Sea. There's, a, there's an actual context for this. This is not just a, a weird, like, it could be ethereal, any water, anywhere on the planet conversation. This is a specific encounter he is writing about. So, you know, he's probably eating breakfast, some, some you know, crocodile eggs and whatever. <laughs> you know, you know, I, don't, I don't know what they do on these islands. They figure it out. And, and you know, he looks up. Oh, there, there's my morning visit. You know, the angel, pow, <laughs> right on the sand in the sea. And he's just standing there look, looking at him like, okay, what you got? A little book. So. Then it says this, um, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Oh, time to get the book. Write them down. When uh, seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but heard a Lord voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered. Do not write them. Oh, man. So the angel whom I saw standing on the Thalassa and on the land reached up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea, Talasa, and the things that are in it, that there should be delayed no longer, but the days of the sounding of the seventh angel when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. So as it goes, John is given the little book, he has to eat it. So what we are talking about here is that um, number one, the mystery of God is finished at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Remember how I told you the mystery is the changing of the church. We talked through all of that. So we've already drawn the dots on a lot of these connections. But, but the point here now is that John is on the Isle of Patmos, and this, this angel is standing on the Aegean Sea. That's the sea that he's standing on. And so with that said, and following this logic, John has another encounter three chapters later in the book of Revelation 13 where, again, he's having an encounter at the sea. It says this, then I stood on the sand of the sea, right here, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. One of the things that I became aware of a long time ago was that there were underwater spirit cities. Sorcerers talk about them. They have specific names for some of them. They're off the island of Africa, not the island, the continent of Africa, Nigeria. I've I've read many accounts of witch doctors that have visited them. Even in Haiti, they have two major spirit world cities right off the coast of Haiti, um, all throughout South America. And really, when I've talked to people, what I've found is that most major coastal cities have a counterpart underwater spirit city 
off of its coast. And they do all kinds of things down there. They cook up all kinds of witchcraft. There are all kinds of entities that actually move down there. Um, it's, it's a world all of its own. I mean, people from Nigeria will talk about how they see sorcerers and they go into the water for weeks or months at a time and then come back with more powers. Um, so considering all of this, in the context of John's vision, I actually think that there's probably, and, and, and I think it's very covered up, but in the Mediterranean Sea itself, one of the most significant underwater spirit structures and, and grids and complexes on the planet. Because Jerusalem is such a key focal point of everything. So the underwater spirit complex there, though I, I, I'm still waiting for someone to start telling me about how they visited that place. I, I actually don't have any actual stories of it. But reading this, I'm just like, gosh darn it, I think this is going to open up eventually. I think that there's something under the Mediterranean Sea specifically that is more, more contextually important than even Antarctica operations. And so we will see what happens. But I think there's something to this that's deeper than surface value. Now, with this, we are going to jump to another passage talking about the Talasa. Which, which, which is interesting, creates an interesting tension. Revelation 16 and verse 2. Now this is in the context of these bold judgments or the judgments of God's wrath being poured out on the earth in the last days. When I was explaining it to you, I said this is likely happening as part of his war procession leading up to the battle of Armageddon and we're pouring out all of these things. In Revelation 16 and verse 2 it says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood. As of a dead man, every living creature in the sea died. And I was like, okay, well, what about this one? Is this sea a reference to just the Mediterranean Sea only? Or is it a more expanded context? I'm going to give you another scripture and say possibly a more expanded context. So everything is context specific because Revelation 16.1 says, I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So this context set by the passage before may expand the conversation on what sea means to be a general body of waters throughout the world. Okay, this is why when we look up the definition of sea as it is written in, 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 in uh, 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 professional text, blueletterbible.org, whatever, they, they will define Thalassa as the sea in general or use specifically of the Mediterranean Sea or the Red Sea. That's, that's the best scholars got. They will actually say it could be all of the above. It's context specific. Y'all following me? I, I, I am going to put a pretty bow on this. I am going to put a pretty bow on this. So talking through all of this. Um. The idea that maybe the sea is the waters uh, uh, actually does kind of fall apart. That is, the waters that are people and nations. Why? Because sea and water is actually two different words. So you do see uh, uh, um, in Revelation 17, the whore of Babylon, and it says in verse 15 or verse 1 of Revelation 17, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Not seas, waters. Not seas, waters. Revelation 17, 15. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people's multitudes, nations, and tongues. So yeah, people can be waters in the word of God and as can nations. But I'd say that is the least likely explanation here. The most likely explanation is what I'm going to give you now. Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 9. So now we're back in the book of Ezekiel. Look at this. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. We're back in the river of life coming from the temple of Ezekiel. It says, there will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to En Eglaim. Pause. That's it. 
Ah, where is En Gedi? I will show you. En Gedi is here. It's actually on the western coast of the Dead Sea. And I said, where is an eglame? I'm going to give you a scripture. Isaiah 15 and verse 8. For the cry has gone all around the borders of Moab. The borders of Moab, it's wailing to eglame. And it's wailing to Beer Elam. Eglam is on the border of Moab, somewhere around here. You can't find it on a common map anymore, but because of the known location of where Moab was, what we do know is that this has nothing to do with the Mediterranean Sea at all. In fact, the temple that is here has an east gate, and out of it flows a river east, and it flows into the sea. Which sea? You know what? It's flowing into the Dead Sea. That's actually what it says. West would be the Mediterranean Sea where John was. What's the conclusion? The conclusion is that based on all of this context, by the time we get to Revelation 21, it is likely that the Mediterranean Sea, the Aegean Sea, which is also the Sea of the Beast, is actually geographically gone. But there is a river of living water that flows to the sea. And everything comes alive. Wouldn't it be interesting to know that it is the Dead Sea that God brings back to life? <laughs> Which means... <laughs> Which means that... You still have bodies of water to be considered sea from which dead will be delivered up at the great white throne judgment a thousand years later. And it says in Revelation 20 verses 13 through 15, and let's read this one more time. The sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The beautiful thing about once we do all of this and work our way through this maze of complexities is that now everything becomes simple. Because when the Bible says the last enemy that will be destroyed is death, that is anchored to the great white throne judgment. And this actually is the end of our book. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 29. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Remember, the beast had their lives prolonged for a season and a time. Satan is put in the pit and then released. It says in verse 25, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. End of story. Amen. Now, there is no cliffhanger. If 
Father God, we just thank you so much for your word today. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your plans. We thank you, Lord God, that we have the opportunity to be part of your plans. We have the opportunity to serve. We have the opportunity to grow. We have the opportunity to rule and reign with Christ. And Lord God, we know that you win. We know, Lord God, that all suffering is, in fact, temporary. And Lord God, we know that we have been called to a high and holy calling. We are a generation sent here for such a time as this. And we thank you, Lord God, that all of your intentions for this transition generation, Father God, we will find our place. We will find our place. We will find our post and we will occupy until you come. Father God, we thank you that we can have resolution, Lord God, because of your word. Confidence knowing that the last enemy that will be destroyed is death death shall be no more it is written and Lord God we thank you that in the process the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea so we just declare Lord God that we receive what you have written about us and I thank you Jesus that your Holy Spirit is present to continue to impart to continue to encourage to continue to comfort writing upon the fleshy tables of our hearts so we release in your presence and in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends online, we'll see you next week.